Good morning, friends, and welcome to worship. It is so wonderful to see all of you today, and thank you to those of you who are joining us online. If you um, do occasionally watch from online, or if you're listening this morning, uh, we have recently added a, a computer speaker upgrade, we hope, so that um, if you're watching at home, we can hopefully get um, a little bit more consistent sound. Uh, Todd has been wonderful every Sunday. You probably don't know this, but every Sunday after the service, Todd um, actually takes down the first video that we record, and then he puts up a higher quality version um, that's taped in the sanctuary. So thank you to him for doing that. But um, we're also hoping that that um, that the new microphone might bridge that gap. So if you are listening online, um, we are glad you're here with us uh, in spirit this morning. And please, you can always um, put uh, information in the comments about about how you are hearing and how you are experiencing the service at home. Um, as we enter into the season of Lent, Lent officially begins next Sunday, and I am hoping to have liturgists, uh, readers for the Sundays of Lent. There are, Lent has a lot of words in it. Um, so if you do not mind public speaking, or if that's something that uh, you are willing to do, I would like to put some folks on a sign-up list that um, would be willing to read for the next six to eight weeks. Just once, one week, that's all I'm asking you to sign up for, not the whole six to eight, unless you're feeling really ambitious. Um, we do have a special coffee fellowship this morning following worship. Our secretary, Sherry, has resigned and has moved to a new position. Um, she is continuing to worship with us, which is a great joy. Um, but we're also sending her off with cake this morning. So please head downstairs, um, grab a slice of cake, wish her well as she heads on to her new job journey. And then you can follow her upstairs at 1050 because she's leading this morning's adult Bible study. So adult Bible study will be up here on this floor. Um, children's um, uh, Sunday school is downstairs with Rowena who is sitting there in the back. Our kids are uh, learning so much in Sunday school this week, it's, uh, this year, it's really fun to watch. Um, we are starting a, an in-person devotional for the season of Lent, it will be, uh, Tuesday evenings at 6 p.m. here in the Fellowship Hall. If that's your usual meal time, you're welcome to bring um, sack lunch, a bag meal, or bring a drink with you. Uh, it is a one hour, a 60 to 75 minute devotional every week. Uh, we really stay within that time frame, so um, 6 to 7 o'clock-ish Tuesdays, starting in two days. Um, our office hours are not shifting by very much. Um, Todd Sivak is filling in for Sherry as, um, as we look for our next secretary. Office hours are Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, 8 to 11.30, and then Thursdays, 8 to 11. So um, just a half hour shorter on Thursdays. Right now, a great way to get a hold of us is by email. So um, if you're debating on whether or not to call or email, email is a, a, a really good way to get a hold of us right now, but we are always happy to talk to you. We have uh, put together a can check. Um, Eric, uh, put that together and it is on the east side of our lawnmower shed. If you look out there, there's now a little baby house that lives on the other side of it. It has a swinging um, top door that you can come and drop your aluminum cans off at any time. We are um, sharing that information with uh, First Presbyterian downtown if they ever want to come up this way and drop off cans. And we're also going to be sharing that information with our neighborhood. Um, for now, the Faith and Life Committee is taking over the responsibility of um, getting cans collected and recycled. Um, what very little we make off the cans, um, we will be putting toward some other environmental goals that we have for this year. Yeah. I emptied it yesterday. We've collected 58 pounds. 58 pounds in a week, that is fantastic. Are we getting 20 cents pound? 25. Hey, <laughs> we're going to be rich soon. <laughs> that doesn't sound too bad. $15 for our first week. We, um, but also, 15, uh, 58 pounds are not going into a landfill if people are not able to recycle at home. 
Thank you for doing that. We also are working on our pill bottle collection and cleaning. Um, we are uh, continuing to collect bottles. Um, Millie there in the back is uh, taking point on some of that. If you have pill bottles at home that you would like to bring in for reuse, they must have a child safety cap on them and they must be translucent in color. So they can't be opaque. You have to be able to see inside the bottle. Um, yellow, orange, blue, green, um, doesn't matter what color it is, just has to be translucent with a child uh, safety cap on it. Uh, please, if you're able, peel off the labels before they come and we can't take bottles that have been Sharpie marked where we can't get the Sharpie off, but otherwise bring them in and we will get them processed. We have an Ash Wednesday service coming up this Wednesday. There's a short soup supper beforehand at 6.30, followed by worship here in the sanctuary at 7 p.m. Uh, that is a brief service. It'll be between 30 and 40 minutes and we'll include the imposition of ashes with it. That's all I have for announcements, but that's probably plenty. Are there any that I've missed that you'd like to share this morning? Let us joyfully and prayerfully call ourselves to worship as we listen to this morning's prelude. Oh, no, I lied. Sorry, you already did your prelude. What's that? Oh, okay, good. I just wrote it in the bulletin wrong. Thanks. we call ourselves into worship this morning, it is with the knowledge and understanding that God with, is with us and God moves through us. Would you please join me in our call to worship? The glory of God shines like a consuming fire. We have seen the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The voice of God thunders like a mighty storm. 
Out of the cloud, God speaks. This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. Come, join me in our first hymn. Jesus, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Yeah, so it's got lots of stickers in it. 
but it made me start thinking about love. Who do you love? Your mom and dad. I love my mom and dad too. Who do you love? love and one's joy and one's happy. Yeah. Well, and the Bible talks about different kinds of love, too. And the Bible talks about the kind of love when you love somebody and marry them and want to spend your life with them. And the Bible talks about what they call brotherly love. <laughs> uh, but we could call it sisterly love, too. And then there's the love that we have for our parents. And the love that Jesus had for his disciples. Oh, don't get distracted on me yet. Oh, give me one more minute. So how do we love God? Oh. Is God like a parent? Yeah, sometimes we even say that, right? We, do we ever say, our Father who art in heaven? Can we think of God like a father? Um, like a parent. How about, do we ever think about um, God as a brother or sister? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Yeah, Jesus, we talk about Jesus being like our brother in some of our Christian songs. How about like a teacher? Do we love God like a teacher? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, Jesus was the one who taught the disciples. And so I think there's something important in that. There is a way that we love God that's different than how we love everybody else in the world. Oh, God shows God's with his love. Wow. <laughs> cool. So that's about how God loves us. One more question, okay? And I'm so glad you pointed that out because that's going to ask you this question. How do we show God that we love God? Prayer. Prayer. Oh, what an awesome answer. What else? Uh, I found God. You found God?
Thank you, God, for giving us different kinds of love that we can have in the world. Thank you for our relationships that are simple and complex, that are easy and that are difficult. And help us to love you above all. Amen. Thank you so much for coming up to join me. And I will see you guys later. While they were getting settled, I had a wonderful video I was going to show you this morning of how to sing this song, and I lost it. Um, so where it says video then him uh, two times for both verses, I'm actually going to ask Kim if she'll play it through um, one time so that we can get a sense of it, and then I will ask you to stand and body your spirit as you're able. This um, song today is done in what they call the Taizé um, a type of music. It's sort of um, like a modern sung chant. The, the verses are usually short, and the tune is meant to be sung either accompanied or a cappella. So um, really kind of rose in the mid to late 70s and has continued to expand in, in the Christian world in, in ways that we sing. So uh, listen, listen first, and then we'll stand and sing together. We'll sing both verses through two times. Yes. Um, English, Latin, English, Latin. We'll try our Latin today and see how, how good we can do.
join me in prayer. Speak to us, O Lord, our God, and let the fire of your spirit burn brightly in our hearts. Open our minds to receive the wisdom of the law, the hope of the prophets, and the life of the gospel, Jesus Christ, your living word. Amen. Our scripture reading for this morning comes from Psalm 99. The Lord is king. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. Mighty king, lover of justice, you have established equity. You have executed justice and the righteousness of Jacob. Extol the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those who was called in his name. They cried to the Lord, and the Lord answered them. He spoke to them in a pillar of cloud. They kept his decrees and the statutes that God gave them. The Lord our God, you answered them. You are a God who is forgiving to them, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. Extol the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. So ends the reading of the word. So technically this is Transfiguration of the Lord Sunday. And it's a transitional day in the church calendar. It, um, the cynic in me says that they felt like they needed to put uh, the trans, uh, transformation of the Lord somewhere, so they stuck it here. Um, because it, does, it, it could fit in many different places in the church calendar. But where it lands is uh, at the end of Epiphany and the beginning of Lent. And uh, scholars who look at it say, this is where we should put transfiguration of the Lord because it is, um, it is sort of a, a one of these culmination unveiling stories that we see Jesus revealed as Lord, which is what we've been looking at in Epiphany, are the ways that God is exposed to us as God. And um, it is also this uh, another transition in Jesus' ministry where Jesus moves uh, closer to this walk that Jesus will be taking to Jerusalem that we experience in the season of Lent. So um, on one side, we have this continued revealing of Jesus in the world, and we learn more about Jesus' character and his place in the prophetic line, and um, we get this sense that Jesus is the one who is chosen by God for a, a specific purpose. This word should be world, not word. Uh, uh, chosen by God for a specific purpose in the world. Jesus was brought here for a reason. And then on the other side, we see Jesus continuing his journey toward, Lent, uh, toward Jerusalem. Uh, this path that Jesus takes that eventually leads to crucifixion. All that said, um, transfiguration, I believe, is one of the hardest concepts in uh, the Gospels for us to understand. Um, and so I'm not talking about it beyond that much. Uh, scholars all disagree on it. And if you're uh, wondering why that is, it, it's basically this. Jesus um, goes up on a mountaintop with a couple of disciples and lights up like a modern LED light. And then there's a couple of, uh, of, of ancient, uh, well-respected um, Israelite rulers that show up and God says, I'm really happy with you. And that's, that's the whole scene. That's basically all we get. And, and scholars have, have uh, for two millennia, tried to figure out what, uh, what all the significance is here. Um, and most of them land at this answer. It is a holy mystery. 
And so I think we'll leave it there for today and call it Holy Mysterious. Um, but it is set um, alongside in the readings uh, that are paired in the, in the, the lectionary texts uh, that we have in the church calendar. The Transfiguration of the Lord is paired with what we call the enthronement song. And uh, most of these enthronement psalms are some of the ones that you know as these like um, shorter snippet psalms. Uh, the psalm for this morning was only nine verses long. We get them, you know, um, probably short as I think it's about six verses up to about 15 verses. And these enthronement psalms, um, you can see uh, the others that are within that genre, but they, they have a specific purpose. And these enthronement psalms, what they do is they don't tell us anything new about scripture, which is often what we expect, right? Like we come to a scripture text and we expect that we will learn something new about the character of God or see something revealed in the character of God. Uh, but that's not the point of the enthronement psalms. Instead, the point of the enthronement psalms is to uh, solidify what we already know. The ideas here are not unique or unfamiliar to us. So instead, um, what we are seeing are these are the things that, that we already know about God. And we are reinforcing them with the words that we say and the words that we hear. Uh, sort of like um, how we today do some of the same things every week. They are um, themes that we enforce, like the Lord's Prayer and uh, the glory of patria and, and our statements of faith, that's sort of um, maybe an equivalent to what these enthronement psalms are. They're a way of saying that we know who God is and we know how God operates in the universe. So what do we know? We know that the God of the psalms is our God. That it is this God, not another God, but this is the same God who brought the slaves out of Egypt, Moses, Aaron, and their sister Miriam. This is the same God that centuries earlier rescued God's people. It is not a new or different God. And we get this in, in verse 6 where it says, Moses and Aaron are among his priests. Samuel also among those who are called on his name. They cried to the Lord, and the Lord answered them. So this is um, establishing that this is the same God that has come down uh, through the centuries with the Israelite peoples, a God that is unchanged even as the generations rise and pass away. And... Um, when, when we see that the people cry out and God answers them, we learn something else about God's character. We um, solidify or remind ourselves again that God shows a willingness to act in the world on behalf of God's people. Just as God led Moses out of Egypt with the people who he brought from slavery, so this God is still active in the world today. This enthronement psalm uh, takes, the, um, takes the ancient history and reminds us that this is still in the here and now. While this is the God of the past, it is also the God of the current. It's an active and living God that listens to those who call upon the Lord. Okay, so that's that's the first piece that we get. And then we have the established relationship, which is, uh, which is not unfamiliar to us, but it's important in this theme of enthronement because again, it, it is tying the majesty of this God who created the universe to um, this small band of people who are often oppressed, who have no um, mighty army, no, um, no valiant uh, amount of resources, that this God is the same God that has established a relationship with them 
for forever. So God is, the, the, the psalm is saying, this God is not a stranger. This God is not new. God is being named here as our Lord. And it's the same God who has been present in past experiences of God's people. Um, now that may sound strange, but remember, they are living in a plurality culture in which the gods do rise and fall. You know, we're talking about people who've been exposed um, to a, a, a plethora of gods, and often when kings are god, kings are seen as gods. And so, when you have the rise of a new king in a foreign nation, you have the rise of a new god. Or if you have the death of a king, sometimes that king will become a god in that culture. So when you look at the context around it, that's when it's important to say, oh, okay, this is, this is the same God. This is not a new God. This is not a reincarnation of God. This is not a God that we have borrowed from our neighbors. This is not a God who is a type of ghost, who is the, the, the one who is um, uh, coming from a different place. But instead, this is, this is our God, our God who is continuous, a God who has an established relationship with us, and a God who is different from the gods of all of our neighbors. So we see, we really get this right at the beginning in verses 1 and 2 where God is sitting and God is exalted on God's throne, and, and the language here is in the present tense. This is, uh, well, it talks about, well, the psalm talks about God's past deeds. It begins with the idea that God is alive and present now. And we see it as it carries into the past, as it moves and, 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 and slopes toward the conclusion where it says, the Lord our God, you answered them. You are, you were a forgiving God to them. So then we have this weaving of, of the present with the past. And this, this points us, um, where, where it all leads us, is that this is a, a, a worldwide scope of God. Uh, this understanding that the Israelites have about their God, it's so different than what their neighbors are experiencing because they are in these uh, dynasties in which kings become gods, or strong rulers become the ones who are worshipped, or gods can be killed by other gods, or they can fall away. Um, it, it's really, it's really quite unique in a, in a way that we forget when we are reading for an outsider. But the God of the Israelites was like no other God because the God of the Israelites was a God for all people and for all time. Uh, the professor Rolf Jacobson um, is, a, is, a, is a beautiful scholar of the Psalms and I want to read you a, a paragraph and a half or so here that he wrote because it, he points out the uniqueness of, of this experience in a way that I, that I can't put into words. He says this, he says, for Christians who we are well accustomed to confessing that either Christ is king or God is king, it might be easy to miss the astonishing counterculture claim of these psalms. But if we take a little time and exercise a little imagination, we can tune our ears to hear the proclamation of the psalms. Imagine where this psalm and others were performed in the ancient world, in a modest little temple. Let's be honest, on a smallish mountain, Zion, in a tiny kingdom, Judah, that was constantly being dominated by the great empires of the age, like Egypt and Assyria, and Babylon, and Persia, and Greece, and Seleucid, and Rome, and others. And in that setting, some priest, some poet, or some prophet was struck by the courage 
to announce that its God, the Lord, was the king of the entire earth and heaven. And therefore the people should tremble because he is exalted above all the peoples. Jacobson goes on to say, um, we can be pretty sure that the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Seleucids, and the Romans were not overly impressed. They were often quite annoyed by this little kingdom of Judah, whose people so often rebelled against the imperial control. Oh, what a great summary to give there. Because it, it does, it points to this, this wonderful relationship that we have with God that is not only a relationship of the past, but a relationship of the future and the relationship of now. This enthronement psalm reminds us that our God, while a God of people who are small, our God is also the God of the entire creation upon which we live. So it leaves us with these conclusions. We praise a living God, and not just a living God, but a living God who has established a relationship with humankind that goes back farther in human history. This is a God who has done past good deeds for us, and who we can trust and believe to do good deeds in our future good deeds in the future of the world and good deeds in the future of our own lives. And this God is the God of the universe and all things that are within it. And while others may try to obscure God's majesty through politics and war and manipulation and all the other things that can get in the way, while those other things may try to obscure God's majesty, we as Christians, we as inheritance of this psalm, know who God is. We know that this is the God of the universe. Our unique God. The God who speaks and summons the earth into being now speaks to us, calling us to offer up our lives as a sacrifice of praise.
in your hymnal there, uh, if you haven't already found it, there are numbered pages before the hymn number pages on the very top. Let us say together what faith leads us to believe. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in Jesus Christ, the Holy Human, the Holy God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed, and blessing the children, healing the sick, and binding up the brokenhearted. Eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the deaths of human pain, and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised his Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil. Delivering us from death to life eternal. If you would remain standing in body or spirit as you are able, let us join in hymn number 329. <coughs> Those who are perishing, feed those who are starving, 
comfort those who are suffering, and receive the dying into your arms. Lord, Lord, by your spirit, grant what we ask. We pray for those whom we love. Bless our families, friends, neighbors. Help them in times of trouble, and be near when they are afraid. Lord, by your spirit, grant what we ask. Holy One, make us ready for the day when this world is transfigured, transformed, and made new, when all things will shine in the light of your glory, through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We, uh, as we join in our closing hymn, we'll sing uh, two verses of, of hymn number 853. Verse 1, we are marching in the light of God. Verse 2, we are dancing in the light of God. Let us join our voices together. shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.